Carolyn is a principal scientist at NIWA and associate professor at the University of Auckland. Carolyn's research interests are focused on the development and application of spatial tools to aid decision making in the marine environment. Car Carolyn currently leads a project on integrating ecological responses to cumulative effects <coughs> into spatial planning tools and has led a project with HBRC looking at opportunities to integrate spatial tools into planning decisions. Let's give a big, big welcome to Carolyn. Uh, Tenet Kato Katoa, Ko San Bruno, Temonga, Ko Crystal Springs, Te Awa, Ko Temoana te Nui Akiwi, uh, Takumoana, No Sweden, uh, Hoki Oko Tipuna, um, Ifano, uh, Mai Aho, I San Francisco, No Kiri Kiri Roa, Aho, Ko Carolyn Lundquist, Taku Ingoa. Uh, so we, we were having a good chat about um, ancestry in San Francisco, and I'm not sure if anyone noticed with the uh, chief science advisor's presentation, there was a picture of my, um, my Rohe. There was San Francisco showed up in one of her maps, so um, that was where I did my PhD research. Um, but anyway, what I'll be talking about today is um, a case study that uh, we worked together with the Hawke's Bay Marine and Coastal Group in uh, the Hawke's Bay region. There are a few of our Hawke's Bay Marine and Coastal Group members here, but obviously most of them are actually home in the Rohe working on the emergency response. But this project is really co-developed with them, and let's see if I can manage to move forward. And that's just a bit of an idea of who they are. Uh, this is a very large group of iwi and stakeholders. It includes industry, it includes central and regional government. And um, back in late 2018, when the second phase of the challenge was just being kind of determined on what we were going to do, we were looking for a new case study areas. Where can we enable EBM? And there was this great opportunity of this group that it formed, and I think it was about 2015 or 16, something like that. Becky's nodding. I'm close enough. Um, but they formed because there was more than just perceived but a known degradation of the Hawke's Bay region and a desire to do something about it, and by getting all of the parties at the table to come up with solutions and work together toward those solutions. Um, so Sustainable Seas was um, invited to come to the party and see what tools that we had that could help inform the dialogue. So we had uh, first, what uh, we had is our first stage one, and this started before COVID and kind of finished in the middle of COVID. And anyone in the last three years who's done stakeholder um, workshops, who we with humans in a normal environment like this, where you can talk to people, you can recognize their responses, you can see from their faces whether they have no idea what you're talking about. Um, we went virtual about halfway through, and we did manage to, I think, come to some great solutions, but we haven't really been back there in person in quite a long time and are hoping to get back um, in the next month or so. But anyway, in stage one, you saw, I think it was Liz's presentation, had one of these systems maps. So with just Justin Connolly of Deliberate uh, leading this part. We developed a systems map in the Hawke's Bay, and we were concentrating on two main stressors that were pre-agreed on with the challenge and HBMAC, which was looking at sedimentation and fishing. Haven't pressed it enough. There we go. So we've got bottom trawling disturbance. Yes, it does cause impacts. Yes, there are different opportunities we can do, either reducing fishing pressure, changing the types of nets and wing spreads and weights and things like that, um, moving to things like trawl corridors so we reduce our footprint. There are solutions that we can do in managing bottom trawling and land based sediment. Now, Often most of these solutions are kind of beyond that boundary, so they're upstream. But these were the two stressors we were looking at. And then what we were looking at them stressing on, these are those biogenic habitats. I like calling them the cute and fluffy bits on the seafloor. They're important for lots of things, and for the group, they were seen as that thing that recogn they recognized as indicating or underpinning uh, the function of the Hawke's Bay seafloor ecosystem. Um, and so we know these habitats are degraded. And how can we use models in this case? So the talk, you're probably all going, oh, no, this is a techie talk. Um, how do we use technical tools, our spatial models, to help us uh, 
trying to determine what solutions might be useful, which ones are probably not going to get us anywhere, and how big of a change we actually need to make to get that recovery. So here's our model. Uh, one of the other kind of key lessons that comes from using fancy spatial tools is how do we make them accessible and informative? It's not a whole giant box of code and everything is. Well, actually, that is what it is. But turning it into cartoons and things like that, a lot of these drawings were done by one of our NIWA colleagues, Nidhi Yogesh. And so we've got this seafloor that we've turned into a bunch of cartoon boxes. We can all see those and go, oh yeah, you got some sponges, you got some crabs, yep, we know what those look like. And if we want to think of a healthy ecosystem, might be those orange boxes, and it has all the bits and pieces there. So that's what we want. So think orange is good. And we also know there are all those bits and pieces. We know the biology. There's, you know, decades of research looking at different types of animals, looking at impacts of fishing, looking at impacts of sediment, particularly out of researchers out of Neewa and Hamilton. And so we've divided our little world into eight different types of groups of beasties. You're not needing to know your species or your genus or anything like that. And then we go, here's our Hawks Bay. We've made a model that's now in the Hawks Bay. And we play around with, let's put a disturbance in there. This can be a sediment disturbance. It can be a fishing disturbance. So imagine you're that little box in this mosaic of little boxes around the seafloor. We disturb it. Stuff comes back. We know based on biology what the rates of things coming back might be. We know what things are dependent on hard structure, like shell hash. Um, and in this particular example, what we're most interested in is that orange bit or that biogenic habitat, so the cute fluffy bits. Um, and this is probably not going to work. Are you able to press go on the orange blob? Ha ha. So we can make videos. I didn't think that was going to work, but it did. So there we go. We've got a model, and you can see here you have a disturbance happening. This was a pretty low disturbance run, but you get some of the other opportunistic beasties coming in. Your starfish, they tend to be kind of scavengers. So if you have a trawl go in, you have some animals that are uh, left um, injured or dead that scavengers come in. So we can kind of see those dynamics in this cool little video. Um, oops. Now I probably need to get it to the next one. And so we have the baseline of this model. We've now populated for the Hawks Bay and through a series of these wonderfully patient workshops with our um, Hawks Bay Marine and Coastal Group, they've got an idea of how this model works and then what types of what we call management interventions they they can put in. So what are things that we talked about around the room? What can we do to make a difference to enable recovery of the Hawks Bay? And so the main things we talked about were what can we do different with fishing effort, either changing the effort itself. We did talk a little bit about different methods, so reducing the vulner, you know, sensitivity to the bottom or vulnerability or impact, um, changing the amount of sediment coming in, again, recognizing the nice little challenge boundary with land and sea, so we didn't say how, we just said how much sediment we were reducing, and we also put in some spatial closures. That's just had to have a nerdy flowchart diagram, but a key thing is where we discussed we wanted to actually run a model that showcased what is the current state. So in model world, you do a lot of model balancing and run-ups and stuff like that. But then we actually ran it with what we thought were the current conditions for both fishing effort and for sediments to come up with, here's what we think the world looks like now on the seafloor. So in this case, then we were looking at probably a reduction of to about 25% of probably what we had as seafloor habitat hat 100 years ago. So that was more or less what the model suggested. And then in that green part on the map, then we're coming in with our stakeholder group with these co-developed scenarios to say, well, what happens if we do this? How much better do we get? And so uh, this is just showcasing some of the information that went in. So our fishing stressor, we do have lovely maps there. Red basically means a lot. Um, that light lemon yellow means not so much in terms of fishing stressor, but you can see that fishing is not distributed equally. We have awesome places for fishing, and we have places where either there's a closure for recovery, for example, the Wairoa Hard, or there may not have been kind of good fishery resources there to begin with. So fishing is not distributed equally, 
and we know the impacts both from New Zealand studies. Simon Thrush mentioned some of the quite early ones in New Zealand in the 90s and early 2000s. We know what happens when we have trawls on the seafloor, and we know quite a bit about the relative recovery rates of different animals. So that's another nice little nitty pictorial down on the bottom. So high fishing effort, we have a lot less animals in a different community, low fishing effort, we're more not likely to have that lovely kind of the orange bit where we have all the bits and pieces. Uh, sediment, well, this is an interesting one and particularly relevant in the last month or so, but sediment, we do have fantastic models from land that tell us, that's the picture on your left, what's going on with sediment from the sednet models. So the difference in the tan and the brown circles, brown would have been sediment that would have been kind of pre-European levels. You can, if you've heard any of these rivers in the recent future in the news, I'm sure everyone's heard of Wairoa, but the Wairoa is, that's one of the big blobs there. A lot of sediment comes down there. And then a lot of the other ones, the tank catchments, are a lot of those tiny little sediment inputs in a normal year. Um, that's quite different this year. So of interesting things that I know the council is working on getting is what is the new amount of sediment that's come down from these catchments. But that's just that idea of how much sediment is coming down now in town versus brown a few hundred years ago. Sediment coming down our rivers and eroding is natural in New Zealand. There's a lot more now, but we always have had natural levels. So. How do we work that in the model? We go, mm, we haven't done that yet, but we're working on putting the sediment into the model. There's a PhD student that I'll mention in a minute, um, one of Karen Bryan's, this is Ted Conroy, Ted Conroy at Waikato Uni, and he is part of his PhD that he's submitting in the next couple months, has made a hydrodynamic model and thus has new maps that we have of where the spatial variation in sediment deposition is. When we did the models for this project, we didn't have that yet. So we kind of came up with the proxy, which are these lovely, that lovely, I don't know, it's almost like there's a little starfish in it in the middle, that blue thing. But those are the maps of expected sediment on the seafloor. Uh, we used as much information as we had. Much of these were anecdotal. We threw a bit of multi-beam data in there to come up with what we thought the sediment looked like. And then in the model, we kind of increased the sediment on the seafloor. So we say it either gets muddy it gets less muddy. And again, from a whole bunch of empirical studies, we know what mud does to the animals on the seafloor, like in that picture down on the bottom. Spatial closers, we can plug in. The main thing that's important here is, and I think this was alluded to in one of the first panels on Wednesday morning, Closures, where you put them matters. If you put a closure just to get that 30 by 30 and you put closures in places where they're not actually a tool that's doing anything, they're not actually preventing any stressors, they're not addressing things like sediment, you know, adding a marine protected area does not address sediment or nutrient impacts from land. Um, if you put them in places where they're not making a difference, they don't make a difference. If you put them in places, for example, the ones right near Ahariri Estuary, right near the port, you can see they're right overlapping in the right-hand graph. Um, sorry, there probably is a pointer here. Oops, nope, don't want to do that. Backwards, forwards. <laughs> um, we won't try the pointer, but look up at those who know where Napier is, I hope, a few of you. Um, but you can see in the picture on the right, we've got some polygons of these, you know, possible closures sitting right over heavy, um, heavy fishing effort areas. So that's cool. That will make a difference. It will make a difference many ways, which was part of why our project also had the systems map, because if you're removing the majority of the fishing effort, you're also removing the economic livelihood of a number of people in the Hawke's Bay, the mana associated with fishing, the connectivity with Tongaro, et cetera. So a lot of our project that I'm not discussing at all is in our systems map report that really showcases the diversity of values and relationships within the Hawke's Bay. And I've got two minutes left, so I'm gonna quickly show here some scenarios that we did just showcasing how much mud do we need to remove to get more of our biogenic habitat. And then we worked 
um, online. Imagine doing post-its and drawing online. We used Miro. It was quite exciting to put some post-its in there. So there are post-its are magically appearing as if you were in a room. Um, and the group coming up with what are scenarios we want to look into. So um, we've got one here where that blob that's A, let's reduce fishing by a substantial amount there. We have another one, and I'll, I've got all four up here. So we've got one where we basically put a coastal Rahui, and Joe would have just talked about these a moment ago. So three very different scenarios in terms of what was um, pseudo implemented for fishing and also different in terms of what was implemented for sediments. So we had a, I think it was a 10 and a 15 and a 25% reduction in sediment loads. Um, again, remember most of those tan and brown blobs, the tan was usually two or three or five times the size. So reducing by 10 or 15% sediment seems like a big deal, maybe, but no, you probably need to be reducing by 50% or more. Um, that's just one example uh, showing that Rahui scenario and a whole bunch of lovely numbers to show the differences. The key thing is when you looked at it across where the fishing closures were put and what type of sediment reductions were put in place, the actual percent reduction, even though the big picture target was uh, quite different, the annual percent reduction in sediment was quite similar and the reduction in fishing was on the level of 12 to 17 percent, so not as much as people thought, drawing beautiful pictures on a map. And so our scenarios basically showed quite similar outcomes on the other way, lots of different pathways to positive futures. So lots of different ways to get there, lots of things we could do, but that we needed to go big. I've got a lovely zero there. So what's next? So uh, within the spec set project 1.2, we've got, I think, four posters out there. Please have a look at them. And so we're basically populating with new sediment maps so that we can get that spatial variation in sediment um, into the map and then hopefully be then helping inform the post cyclone response. And here's some pictures of our lovely the uh, reports. Not too far over. Sorry, Julie. Here I cut it.